Good day. I'm Tom Costello in for Halley. And as we come on the air, the Northeast, including this place, D.C., is baking on the hottest day of the entire year. Across the country, almost half of us are under heat alerts, temperatures reaching dangerous highs. We can't say this enough, and you know what, the heat is deadly. So much so, Maricopa County, Arizona, bringing in refrigerator containers in case they need to store bodies. The medical examiner says they are over capacity, a grim reminder that this is also what happened during COVID, of course. In Minnesota, we're seeing roads buckle in the sweltering temps. Where you live plays a big role in all of this. Climate experts say cities feel a lot hotter than the burbs or rural areas where you're surrounded by landscape and grass and trees that absorb all of that heat. And it's not just above ground. Feeling the heat, water temperatures across the world are off the charts. Look at this. The Gulf of Mexico hit a record 86 degrees. North Atlantic, almost 80. The Mediterranean, the sea and the tropical Atlanta around that area, 83. And the worst may be yet to come, unfortunately. Let's go to George Solis. He is out in the Philadelphia heat, and he's actually in the water. I don't blame you one bit, buddy. Uh, you're in the city of concrete and asphalt. And so I'm guessing the kids behind you have been there all day soaking in the cooler temps, right? That is absolutely right, Tom. We're here at the John B. Kelly Pool in the city of Philadelphia, cooling off much like my friends are, because these temperatures, as you have said, aren't just uncomfortable. They can be deadly. So parents are out here making sure their kids are hydrated. Everyone has been enjoying the pool, except for a small, brief period where there was an accident in the pool. Everyone had to get out. They cleaned it up very quickly. So everyone back in the pool, including myself, we are quite comfortable here. The city of Philadelphia has more than 50 pools open right now. They also have their spray centers and their cooling centers. Just everything at their disposal to make sure people can survive this heat wave, which we're hopefully going to break this weekend. We talk about some of the urban heat here. The city is committed to trying to make sure they have some covering and coverage with trees to make sure, hey, this heat isn't going to bake these neighborhoods. Right now, there are a number of plans in place to get more coverage and more shade in this city, and they're hoping to expand that to other cities so we can start beating this heat because we know that these heat waves are happening with larger frequency and they are unfortunately sticking around a heck of a lot longer, Tom. But in the meantime, as you can see, we are quite comfortable in this pool. A lot of the kids out there having a blast. We have been having a blast out here. And we will stay in here, frankly, as long as we can because a lot of people say they want to jump in water during these heat live shots. We're committing to it fully here for the show, Tom. How long have you been in the water is my first question. And is that lifeguard watching, is he running interference for you to make sure that uh, nobody jumps in the live shot and starts splashing the camera? Yes, and actually, our credit to the lifeguards here in Philadelphia because there was actually a shortage as there was nationwide, not here in Philadelphia. They actually offered bonuses for the first time ever to ensure that these pools were staffed, and they have been quite amazingly. And they're running a little bit of interference for us. We had a couple of kids, yeah. you know, jumping in front of the camera. We want to make sure okay. that we're getting all that information to you guys as concisely as possible. So, but yeah, we've been in here for quite a while, and uh, yeah, we might just stick around a little longer, Tom. Showing the guns right there in Philly. George, thanks, buddy. Uh, take care. Sunscreen and water, okay? Sunscreen and water. Let's now get to uh, meteorologist Michelle, Michelle Grossman. M Michelle, there's really only one appropriate question here. When, if at all, when are we going to see some relief from this heat? Oh, Tom, I know that it's a number one question. Well, we are looking at some relief for some. So it's all about location. But first, we're still looking at 146 million people under a heat alert. We have heat advisories, excessive heat warnings. That is in the pink, stretching from the southwest through the plains into portions of the northeast, also New England. But we will get a little bit of a break. We have a strong cold front moving through. That's going to bring the break for portions of the Great Lakes into the Midwest. Notice three degrees below average in Milwaukee. That's a good sign. But still really warm tomorrow in portions of the northeast, the mid-Atlantic. 
Atlantic, Richmond 97. You factor in that humidity, it's going to feel closer to 107, feeling like 106 in Nashville, feeling like 106 in St. Louis. But look what happens as we go through, through Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. In New York City, the low 80s, low humidity. A strong cold front's going to move throughout Saturday. That's going to bring the price of some storms, some really gusty storms, but Sunday's going to be the payoff. By Tuesday, 81 degrees. Boston, 75 degrees on Sunday. And we're keeping it in the 70s in Buffalo, Cleveland, Chicago. Also, portions of Cincinnati feeling really good, too, in the 80s. Tom? All right, now we're talking. Listen, I got to ask about this. If this is climate change, if we're seeing the effects of climate change, is this the new normal? And what will the impact be? We talked about how hot the oceans are right now. Yeah. What's the impact on the fish, on the wildlife? Yeah, no, everything points to that this is the new normal. Yesterday, the UN Secretary General said we're kind of ending uh, global warming, we're entering global boiling. And we're seeing this in the oceans as well. Wait till you see these numbers because we're looking at numbers in portions of the Gulf of Mexico in the upper 80s. So they're going from the sauna like feeling on land into the jacuzzi. We're looking at 86 off the Gulf of Mexico. In the, uh, off the coast of Mexico, uh, excuse me, Florida. And then we're looking at 87 off the coast of Texas. And then this is just in the U.S. Globally, we are looking at record numbers, ocean numbers. So North Atlantic, 76 degrees, Gulf of Mexico, 86, Manatee Bay, Florida, 101. I mean, that is just staggering. Hard to wrap your head around. And then we're looking at the Mediterranean Sea, 83, Tropical Atlantic, 83. And we are in a marine heat wave. 45% of the oceans, that's almost half of the global oceans in a marine heat wave. They're more intense, they're frequent, they're longer lasting, just like our extreme weather. There is a direct link. The warmer the water, the slower the jet stream. The jet stream is sort of like the conveyor belt at the grocery store. It moves things along. It moves our weather systems along. So that's why things are getting stuck. And that's why we're in this heat wave going on five weeks now. Tom? All right, Michelle, thank you very much. Uh, we'll check back with you. In just the last few hours, police in Alabama charged Carly Russell for lying to authorities and faking her kidnapping in a hoax that set off a nationwide effort to find her and really created a panic and alarm about a toddler who might, police feared, might have been used as bait. The police chief says those charges are not enough. Take a listen. I know many are shocked and appalled that Miss Russell is only being charged with two misdemeanors. Despite all the panic and disruption her actions caused. Let me assure you, I too share the same frustration, but existing laws only allow the charges that were filed to be filed. You will remember, of course, Carly Russell called police on July 13th, claiming she saw a toddler walking alone along a highway, and then she was gone for 49 hours. In that time, she said a man forced her into a truck and took her to a house. It wasn't until earlier this week that her lawyers released a statement saying there was no kidnapping. The whole thing was made up. Uh, when we asked about the charges today, Russell's lawyers said we will go and we will see where we go from here. And Mrs. Priscilla Thompson joins us now. Priscilla, walk us through the charges here. We heard the police chief say he's frustrated uh, that given the panic that this caused, the charges she's facing are really not that serious. Yeah, Tom, so Carly Russell has been charged with two misdemeanors, one for false reporting to law enforcement authorities and a second for false reporting an incident. And each of those misdemeanors carries up to a year in prison and a $6,000 fine. We know that Carly Russell was arrested earlier today and has since been released on bond. But what police are saying is that this is what the law allowed them to charge her with. But the message that they wanted to send with these charges, even even though they are misdemeanors, is that there are consequences for her actions. They accused her of opening wounds for families of real victims, and they also said that she wasted a lot of time and resources in this search that ultimately ended up being a hoax. And as you mentioned, we have heard from Carly Russell's attorney. He has said that she uh, apologizes for what happened and said that she understands the severity of these charges, even though they are misdemeanors. She's taking them very seriously, and that ultimately they'll see how all of this plays out in court. But what we're hearing from the attorney general is that he plans to prosecute her to the full ex extent of the law. And if this investigation reveals additional charges that can be filed, he says he does intend to move forward with those. Tom. Uh, so this is a story that had people very worried about her and the potential for a kidnapper to be on the loose. You've been on the story from the beginning and you talked to Russell's parents about the community panic that this caused, right? 
Right. I talked to them about that. And this was in the days after Carly Russell had returned before all of this came out. And they were adamant that there was a kidnapper still out there. They were in fear. They were concerned. But obviously what we saw this week is that Carly Russell got an attorney and that attorney read a statement on her behalf saying that she made the whole thing up. All of it was a lie. There was no child on the highway that she did all of this on her own. And we heard her apologizing to the community and to her family and friends for the trouble that she has caused. But still a, a lot of chaos and a lot of people in this community up upset about that, including uh, the folks who helped lead that search effort. Tom. All right. Very well, listen, Priscilla, one more question here. The issue of missing black women and girls is still a big issue that often goes underreported or unreported. And advocates are really urging people to not lose sight of that, despite this case of this woman making the story up. Absolutely. And not losing sight of that is huge here. We're talking about more than 30,000 black women and girls who are missing in this country. And that's not even to mention the numbers when it comes to Latino women, women, indigenous women, and lots of women of color who don't often get that same level of media attention. Yeah. And so you're hearing some people who are concerned that this could lead to um, skepticism and people not being believed in the future. But there are a lot of people that saying the kind of media attention that Carly Russell got is the same kind of attention that these other families of missing women, particularly women of color, deserve as their families try to bring them home. Tom? NBC's Priscilla Thompson. Thank you, Priscilla. We are learning more about who's who in this new superseding indictment that adds three new charges against former President Trump for his handling of classified documents after he left the White House. A source familiar with the matter tells NBC News that Mar-a-Lago IT worker Yusil Taveras is employee number four in those documents. Uh, the new do indictment says Carlos de Oliveira is a maintenance supervisor. Talk to Taveras about how, quote, the boss, former President Trump, wanted security footage deleted. Video that prosecutors say shows Mr. Trump's employees moving boxes of classified documents before the FBI searched Mar-a-Lago. De Oliveira's lawyer did not return NBC's request for comment, as well as Tavares, who has not yet been charged. Mr. Trump has pleaded not guilty. Today, the former president was hitting back at the charges on a radio show. They're trying to intimidate people so that people go out and make up lies about me because I did nothing wrong. Garrett Haig joins me now with more on this investigation. You know, the details of this mm -hmm. in, in the uh, special counsel's indictment are really meticulous. I'm wondering what the feedback is. Well, it's been interesting. The Trump campaign has responded pretty quickly to this in the way that they often do, describing it as political and really leaning into it as an opportunity to raise money. They've been blasting out fundraising emails. The former president's been posting on social media. They're trying to cast this in the same way they've cast all the investigations into him as a political witch hunt. Now, congressional Republicans got off a little bit, er, e uh, a little bit easy here because Congress was out yesterday afternoon. Uh, by the time this indictment was released, most of these folks were at home in their districts. They haven't had the answer difficult questions about it. When they have gotten asked, it's gone something like this. Here's Kevin McCarthy today trying to kind of have it both ways on this indictment. What concerns me is you have a sitting president that has a situation like this, but even worse, that had documents, like, but nothing's happened. You've had, and he's, he's How is it worse? Because he's alleged, they're alleging but he's obstructed the investigation. Had, he's under investigation. But he's not him. indicted. Why do they keep indicting presidents? Be, who knows? No, it's forever. It might be, who knows? That's the point. Who knows? You're a Biden, so it's never going to happen. That's the difference, and that's the frustration. And the word seems to have gone out on this, Tom, because that's what we're hearing from a lot of other Republicans, the idea that, hey, look, Joe Biden's been investigated for something similar in terms of investigating his handling of classified documents. Where are the charges on him? I mean, obviously, these are wildly different scenarios, yeah. wildly different cases, but the whataboutism is, the, is sort of the main talking point we're seeing from Republicans right now. So this caught everybody by surprise yesterday, this new superseding indictment, because everybody has been waiting mm -hmm. for a, a possible indictment from the grand jury investigating the, pres the former president's attempt 
attempts to allegedly overturn the election and specifically related to January 6th. Where do we stand on that potential grand jury indictment that may or may not be coming? Is it or is it not? Well, look, every indication is that it is still coming. It's just a question of when. And we base that mainly off the target letter that Donald Trump received more than a week ago now. Federal prosecutors just don't send that kind of thing unless they are committed to making an indictment. Now, this indictment that came out last night, the superseding indictment, appears to have caught Donald Trump and his attorneys off guard, which is fascinating because they were in the office with the special counsel prosecutors just yesterday during the day talking about this election interference case. But I can't get any read on sort of on the record or in any other way that they were given any kind of heads up that this might also be coming. They are very much convinced that Donald Trump will be indicted on something related to the election interference case, but they don't know specifically what and even they don't know specifically when. So they're in this meeting yesterday and then, oh, hey, by the way. There's another indictment coming, and you didn't know anything about it. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there was any, oh, hey, by the way, which, you know, prosecutors are under no obligation to tip their hands about things that they're going to do. But, look, the Trump people believe, broadly speaking, that the DOJ is, is not playing this as gentlemanly as they could. Let's put it that way, that this is kind of a bare-knuckle legal fight. And the idea that you would have the lawyers for the other side in and not even give them a heads up uh, may be ungentlemanly, but it may also be, you know, the way that the special prosecutor wants to do this, by the book. Garrett, thank you. Garrett Haig, always on the story. Uh, in just, in just a few more hours, a big moment for Republican presidential candidates. Former President Trump and nearly every other GOP candidate is in Iowa for the same campaign event, the GOP Lincoln Day Dinner. For Mr. Trump, it's a, it's a rare appearance at an event that puts him in the lineup with the rest of the crowded field. He is keeping himself busy in the aftermath of the new charges against him, campaigning at two events tonight, then holding a rally in Pennsylvania tomorrow. While for his biggest rival in, in the field, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, this is a chance to revamp what's become a stalled campaign, especially now as he's getting backlash from members of his own party over that new education law in Florida. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is in Des Moines. The potential Trump indictment looming large over the Lincoln dinner tonight here in Iowa, where 13 presidential hopefuls will take the stage, basically everyone except Chris Christie. And the event will mark the first time that former President Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will be at the same event here in Iowa, this crucial early voting state. And while President, former President Trump is still enjoying a massive lead here in the polls, Governor DeSantis is trying to reset his campaign and trying to gain some ground. We spoke with some of his supporters at one of his events last night. Take a listen to what they had to say. President I Trump. voted for Trump and I support him 100 percent. But now you think <clears throat> perhaps DeSantis? <clears throat> yeah, just because I don't know that it's Trump's fault that he's got so much baggage, mm -hmm. but because the Democrats just present too much baggage for him. Meanwhile, Governor DeSantis is facing criticism from one of his other GOP rivals, Senator Tim Scott, who is blasting him over those controversial African-American teaching standards that were just adopted by the state of Florida. The governor has said that any criticism of the standards, which includes a portion that talks about potential benefits that uh, slaves got while they were in captivity. The governor has said that that was taken out of context, that overall the standards are robust. But last night, Senator Tim Scott said that there is no silver lining to slavery. Joining other Republicans, including Congressman Byron Donalds and Vice President Kamala Harris, in attacking Governor DeSantis. Again, his campaign pushing back on that. But that issue, plus the issue of the looming Trump indictment, again, looming large here in Iowa, just a few hours before the Lincoln dinner. Back to you. Okay, Gabe, thanks very much. Turmoil in Niger and global condemnation as the head of Niger's presidential guard has named himself the leader of a transitional, transitional government just two days after overthrowing the country's democratically elected president. The general appearing today on state-run television saying the military coup was necessary, he says, to avoid what, again, he says, is the gradual and inevitable demise of the country. The political upheaval is worrying leaders in the West because Niger is seen as the last reliable partner in the region to combat jihadists linked to al-Qaeda and other extremists.
NBC's Courtney Cuby is the only correspondent on the ground in the country. Uh, she's joining us now. First of all, nice timing, Courtney. You were there at exactly the right moment. Still a fluid situation, <laughs> right? What's the latest? Yeah, that's right. It's very fluid. So, I mean, you, you mentioned that just today we heard from the head of the presidential guard service he declared himself this is uh this general declared himself as the new president here and what's critical here is after this address to the nation on state-run television a number of service members senior service members across the services army national guard even the special operations forces all appeared in a photo with him seeming to approve this new government. Now, the democratically elected president, President Bazoum, is believed to still be in custody here in Niamey, in the capital, being treated well. But at this point, Tom, he has not relinquished power. He has not signed any document saying that he is stepping down. So the U.S. and many other nations around the world continue to recognize him as the democratically elected leader of this country. Now, the big question is, what happens next? And in a simple answer, we just don't know. The U.S. still has not recognized this as a coup situation here because President Bazoum has not resigned. But that's what we're all watching for. Does the U.S., does the world recognize there is an attempted military coup here? And the, again, the democratically elected president may have been ousted, Tom. You know, Niger has been such a critical partner for the U.S., and that's why you were there. You were there to talk about the critical role that the U.S. military is yeah. playing, working with that government and its military to fight uh, extremists. Is there any hint that uh, Russia is in any way behind this coup attempt? So there are a lot of rumors about that. In fact, the head of the, the Wagner group, the mercenary group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, released what appears to be an audio tape from him today saying that they were behind this. We saw protests on the street just yesterday that, that were uh, protesters with rave, uh, waving Russian flags, chanting about Russia. But the reality is we've spoken with a number of U.S. officials here. There's no evidence that the Wagner group is here. They have no indication that Russia or Wagner was behind this coup at this point. So, but the Wagner Group has a pretty strong presence in this region, specifically in the Central African Republic. And there's a lot of concern that Russia or Wagner may try to use any kind of instability here in this country as a, a chance to gain a, fo a foothold here. It's important to point out there's an, a, a vast resource uranium here that the Wagner Group and many other nations would try to get a hold of for energy resources, for nuclear resources. So that's a real concern. But again, at this point, Tom, there's no indication of that. At this point, it's also important to point out that we've seen some protests in the street, but so far right now, the curfew is holding and the streets are relatively calm, Tom. As always, Courtney Cuby, cutting edge reporting on DOD, Pentagon and Foreign Service type of uh, stories. Courtney, thank you. Stay safe there in Niger. <laughs> Uh, stocks today are uh, reacting positively to new data that su suggests inflation in this country is finally cooling. The Dow Jones Industrials and the Nasdaq both closed higher. The Dow up half a percent. The Nasdaq up almost two percent. Both the Dow and the broader S&P have closed out their third straight winning week. And that rally helped along by this key stat that economists use to measure inflation, hitting its lowest level in two years. Investors are hoping that means the Fed will pause hiking interest rates, now sitting there at their highest level in more than 22 years. Uh, and that's the good news. All right, now here's the bad. Gas prices are going up again. The national average for gas now 371 a gallon, up 13 cents from last week. Still lower than last summer's high, all-time high of 5 bucks a gallon. Caleb Silver joins me now. Caleb, let's start with gas prices. How much of that is related to Russia and OPEC, and should we expect higher prices to come? Yeah, we should expect higher prices to come. So we do know that there are supply uh, constraints in OPEC. They've decided to keep supply down to raise those prices. But also, this intense heat throughout the country, throughout the world, that is putting pressure on refineries, which are not refining at full capacity. So less supply coming onto the market. As you know, summer, busiest travel season of the month for cars. Gas prices usually go up. So you have this perfect storm of what's happening with OPEC, what's happening here with refineries, and a lot more driving. That's driving gas prices up. But overall inflation, is cooling. Everything else is hot, Tom. Inflation itself is cooling.
Yeah, I covered the Fed meeting yesterday for NBC Nightly News, and the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, made it clear he is leaving the door open to possibility, the possibility of raising rates again in September. But read the tea leaves for us now. How likely is it that we'll see a hike again in September, given the improving in inflation picture? Yeah, you heard it yesterday. He keeps he kept saying data dependent. Well, data dependent. Look at the data from today. This is really last month's data. Inflation is cooling three percent, four point one percent on the core because of higher food and energy prices. But if you look across the board, inflation is cooling in most areas, and the job market remains strong. So those two things the Fed has its eye on. They may very well pause, but we're going to have to see yet another couple of inflation reports and employment yep. reports before the Fed's next meeting. And even the Fed staff is saying we may avoid a recession. Caleb, thank you. Caleb Silver on the story. Coming up from us, new research finds more women in the U.S. are drinking themselves to death. What may be behind the trend coming up next. Plus, your eyes are not playing tricks on you. This high-speed carnival ride got stuck in reverse. Imagine that. What crews are saying went wrong later in the local. We're back. Here's a headline grabber for you. More women in the U.S. are drinking themselves to death, according to new research on CDC data. Overall, drinking still kills more men than women, but the gender gap is narrowing. Data from the last 20 years shows that women's alcohol-related death rate rose by 14.7% compared to 12.5% in men. Researchers say the trend is probably linked in part to the normalization of women's alcohol consumption in society. Dr. Kavita Patel is joining us now to give us the lowdown. How much of this, by the way, it's great to see you in person. It's great to be Love having you. Yes. How much of this is because women metabolize alcohol differently than men? Yeah, it's probably startling to hear this, but women are so different in their metabolism that a one drink that I would drink equates to two drinks that a man would drink. And it's because of three big reasons. One, proportionately, we have more fat. We have less water. Water is what helps dilute the alcohol. Fat absorbs the alcohol. And then we also have less of what's called alcohol dehydrogenase. It's a significant enzyme that breaks down alcohol before it gets to our bloodstream. All of that adds up to alcohol being incredibly toxic in lower amounts compared to men. All right, so now for uh, some data out of Columbia University, which says that those drinking the most are women at midlife with the highest socioeconomic status. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Those with the highest incomes and the most educated and the highest status occupations. So right. those are the people drinking the more, most rather, and an increase in marketing may have a role here. It's possible that it's marketing. It's also some kind of achieving, you know, we're breaking glass all over the place as women. But part of that is also having to kind of normalize being out at happy hours, drinking with clients, mm. things that might have traditionally been thought of activities that men do. But also just even some of the little things, Tom, like some of these uh, paint classes with wine or thinking about having a book club with wine, uh -huh. having wine or having alcohol being part of social activities and professional activities, and of course the marketing all around that, normalizing it and trying to take the bias away from it might be doing harm. And listen, a lot of people that I know personally uh, enjoy a glass of wine occasionally. Right. But the bottom line is it's better, what, not to drink at all? I think that everything in moderation, this holds true for diet. So if I were to tell anybody who's enjoying a glass of wine to stop drinking entirely, it would have to be under their desire to stop sure. drinking. But I think what this is pointing out, what's killing women are levels that are over time accumulating in their body. And this is not an average one drink now and again. This is something that's a repetitive behavior. And that's what we should flag. Right. And the treatments for that, too. Interesting. Trying to get that. Yes. Doctor, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Patel in studio with us. All right, let's get you over now to the five things that our team thinks you should know about tonight. Number one, and this is sad, Eagles bass player and singer Randy Meisner has died at the age of 77. He was one of the original members of the Eagles. His voice, perhaps most recognized on that song, Take It to the Limit. In a statement, the Eagles say that Meisner had complications from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Number two, actor Tyler Perry is offering a $100,000 reward for information about the killing of John T. Robinson, a, a black gay man. He says a friend was very close to Robinson. Robinson's body was found 
on a beach in Grenada back in June, according to a local newspaper, which reported that autopsy results showed he was strangled. Police have reportedly not made any breakthroughs. Number three, the Department of Transportation just in the last few hours has released new fuel economy standard procedures or protocols which could, some say, save hundreds of dollars in the gas tank and make the U.S. less dependent on oil from other countries. This is a proposal that suggests making some cars far more fuel efficient, and this is the big thing, possibly averaging 58 miles to the gallon by 2032. Number four on our list, Ford is recalling more than 870,000 pickup trucks in the U.S. because the electric parking brakes can suddenly turn on without the driver doing anything. Ford says it's due to a possible wiring problem and that owners can have their car inspected at a dealership for free. Number five, the Emmys are getting pushed back because of the writers and actors strike. It's supposed to be in September. We don't yet have a new show date for the Emmys. So Italy now, uh, it has a big story going on. A whole bunch of transgender men are entering the Miss Italy pageant after a pageant rep said that transgender women can't compete. Let me lay this out for you here. The organizer of the Miss Italy pageant said the pageant only allows people who were assigned a female gender at birth to compete in the competition, meaning transgender women, men to women, could be excluded. One transgender man named Federico saw this and he thought, well, hey, I was born female, so he decided to enter the pageant under his birth name, Frederica. Now that moment turned into a viral moment. One LGBTQ group shared his entry on Facebook, encouraging other transgender men to apply. So now more than 100 trans men, men to or women to men, have entered the pageant with some even being called to the next stage of the competition. Let's bring in Ali Arusi for more on this. All right, that's a little confusing, but what message is the trans community sending pageant officials here and, and how is it being received? Hey, Tom. Well, they're saying that these attitudes are outdated and the people trying to enforce them lack understanding. Uh, Federico Barbarossa, the trans activist who entered the pageant and started this whole campaign that went viral, says that he thinks beauty pageants try to exclude trans women in part because they simply don't understand them or have a false idea about what it means to be trans. Uh, he said excluding trans women from beauty pageants or school sports sends a message that trans women are not women uh, and that just results in transphobia. Let's take a listen to what Federico had to say himself. They would never think that a trans person might even like aspire to win a beauty pageant because we're seen as this kind of like three-headed monster and i think a part of it is that so many people have never seen trans women or like trans men or trans people in general but the patron of the miss italy beauty pageant patricia mirigiliani has not only defended the ban on transgender contestants, but also appeared to criticize other beauty pageants' efforts to welcome trans women. She said that lately beauty contests have been trying to make the news by using strategies that, in her opinion, are a bit absurd. She said that the Miss Italy contestants should be women from birth and that she had no intention of jumping on what she called the glittery bandwagon of trans activism. Now, those comments came shortly after Ricky Cole became the first openly trans contestant to win the Miss Netherlands a contest. And what's ironic here, Tom, is that these hundred or so trans men who have entered the competition have used its own rules against it. Since the process to have one's preferred gender and name legally recognized in Italy is a lengthy and difficult process and not based on self-declaration, these men technically fit all the criteria to enter the competition. They're Italian nationality or citizenship, they're over 18, they're still registered as female on their identity documents, and they were assigned female at birth. Well, you kind of laid out uh, part of the crux here, right? Italy just elected a far-right government that's been hostile to gay and trans rights. So how is the protest being received really among the broader population in Italy? Well, Tom, when a government's policy doesn't favor the LGBT community, uh, then it's easier for organizations like this to make uh, to not make concessions or not be inclusive. I mean, look, Prime Minister Giorgio Meloni 
denounce what she called gender ideology and the LGBT lobby during her campaign. Her government has barred same-sex parents from being listed on children's birth certificates if they're not biologically related. And she got elected. So her message has resonated with many voters in Italy. But it's made Italy look out of step, and not just uh, uh, on the whole pageant issue, but also with the Dutch pageant as well. Because more and more pageants have started to include trans women in recent years. In 2018, Angela Pons became the first trans woman to compete in the Miss Universe pageant. Then in 2021, Cataluna Enriquez became the first trans woman to compete in the Miss USA pageant after she was crowned Miss Nevada. And some countries like Thailand and Mexico have even held separate beauty pageants for trans women. So although there may be some support for Miss Maloney's policy in Italy, it's making Italy look out of step in the modern times. She was just here in Washington last week. Ali, thank you very much. Ali Rusi for us. When we come back, the race to save an American giant. What scientists are doing to bring chestnut tree trees back to the eastern U.S. and how this technology could be used to preserve not just our forests, but our food. That's a cool story. It's also in our original tonight. All right, we need a dose of cute, right? A couple of rare, critically endangered cubs just born at the San Diego Zoo. And the cute pics are coming up later this hour. First from us, though, we want to bring you today's original with in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. As we have been reporting, the record heat waves are having a destructive impact on coral reefs down in Florida. And there's one technology that could help genetic engineering. Uh, let's take a look at an NBC News report from Kerry Sanders from last year highlighting this novel approach to save the coral. The Pentagon gave researchers at the University of Miami a $7.5 million contract to artificially grow coral that's engineered to resist death due to global climate change's warming waters, then transplant that coral to the ocean floor. All right, but coral, coral is not the only ecosystem that could benefit from this kind of science. As our planet changes, researchers are turning to gene editing to help revive one of America's most iconic trees, and the implications on our food systems are sweeping. So Noah Pransky has a story, the rebirth of the American chestnut. 30 feet up in the canopy, Scientists nearing a breakthrough that could transform U.S. agriculture. And so here you can see like a female. That was They're using the latest advances in biotechnology and genetic engineering to bring back the fallen giants of the eastern forests, the American chestnut. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. A food seared into our heritage in songs, on our ancestors' tables, and often in the tables themselves. American chestnuts were some of the biggest and most prominent hardwood trees in the eastern U.S. Do you have any idea how the girth of an American chestnut at maturity? They could be 18 feet. It's crazy. But around the turn of the century, Westerners accidentally imported a fungus from Asia that caused chestnut blight. And within 50 years, nearly all American chestnuts died, leaving behind only stumps and short-lived tiny trees. Could you imagine what would happen? A blight hits the sugar maple. In 15 years, they're all gone. Look at the culture that disappeared. Every fall going out and tapping the maple trees. That happened to a wide stretch of this country when the chestnut disappeared. Efforts to save the trees began almost immediately. In the 1950s, they took chestnuts and they threw them down into a nuclear reactor in hopes that that would mutate resistance. But breeding resistant trees was only partially successful. So scientists are now turning to gene editing technology to save the species. This is the fascinating part. They use bacteria to transfer a gene found in wheat into a tiny American chestnut embryo. That gene then neutralizes the deadly fungus, so when the embryo grows into a full-size tree, it can survive the blight. This latest genetically modified version is nicknamed Darling 58. At this point, we have several generations of offspring from that initial Darling 58 tree. A team in upstate New York is hand-pollinating wild chestnuts, then letting the trees do the rest of the work for them. In a few months, when those chestnuts drop, some will grow into trees that inherit the resistant gene. 
program. That's what we'll eventually be able to distribute and use for restoration. It'll have some blight resistance and it'll have some diversity. The team will send the genetically modified trees to labs across the U.S. once the process is approved by government agencies. We have really high hopes um, for deploying in the forest. And it couldn't be more urgent. Climate change, diseases, and pests threaten countless species that are cornerstones of our agricultural economy and our diets. By 2050, the amount of land that can sustain coffee cultivation will be reduced by 50%. They call it the cancer of the bananas. Imagine a world without coffee, bananas, or chocolate. That's what scientists are trying to prevent. Our forests are seeing these threats on so many different levels right now. Researchers are also looking at this process to try and protect citrus groves in Florida getting attacked by a harmful bacteria. A new gene, in this case from spinach. Scientists and tree lovers banding together to save an American icon and the future of our food and forests. Noah Pransky, NBC News. All right, here's what's really cool. These trees grow really fast. If the project gets government approval later this summer, children born today will likely be able to sit under the shade of an American chestnut tree before they are 18. Thanks to Noah for that reporting. Coming up, crazy video of, of a burglar falling through a drive through ceiling right in front of the cops looking for him. So that's coming up later. There he is in the local. Plus, Damar Hamlin back on the field with his Buffalo Bills. We're talking, though, to a reporter at training camp about what his future is with the team and could it be in jeopardy? That story's coming up. Now to the Buffalo Bills safety, Damar Hamlin, who is back on the field at training camp almost seven months after going into cardiac arrest on the field after taking a hit to the chest during a game. Fans cheered him when he returned to the field, and he's been able to take part in all of the team's workouts. He also sent LeBron James' family his support this week after LeBron's son, Bronny, went into cardiac arrest during a basketball workout. Bronny is now out of the hospital. Tim Graham, senior writer for The Athletic, joins me now from the Bills training camp. Tim, uh, you've been there at training camp. What's it been like for DeMar since starting up on Wednesday? How is he doing? He's doing fine, and really it's too early to say because a lot of the milestones that he needs to hit, both mentally and physically, are yet to happen. Uh, but every day that he is out on the field is pushing forward a pretty inspirational story. Nobody has ever done this before. He's like an astronaut. Uh, we don't really know what's to come. Nobody's ever come back from a sudden cardiac uh, arrest like he has, and uh, it's been inspirational. But you say in your latest athletic piece that he could get cut from the team, that his story could meet the, the cruel business of the NFL. How could this play out? Well, I think it would be unfathomable to a lot of fans uh, or even people who've been paying attention to his story from a mainstream standpoint, because this has broken out of just the sports world. DeMar Hamlin is the sentimental favorite of the, of the sports world and, and people who don't even pay attention much. Uh, but... He is the fourth best safety if everybody's healthy, and that includes him, and if he's mentally prepared to come back from this, he's the fourth best safety uh, playing for a coach who only keeps four safeties. He's going to have to play special teams, uh, and that is the most uh, dangerous of all the aspects of games. You're talking about kickoff coverage, punt coverage, high collision uh, percentage of plays there. Uh, and this has happened before, and it's something that I wrote about for The Athletic uh, a player who was on the stage at the ESPYs giving an emotional speech uh, was cut two months later. Devin Still of the Cincinnati Bengals and his daughter who went through stage four uh, cancer in a very public way, in a very poignant way, and she's okay now. But two months after he was on the stage, uh, after being introduced by LeBron James, to, uh, you know, this was in 2015, uh, just two months later, he was cut. And it is a cruel business. And uh, the Buffalo Bills are a Super Bowl contending yeah with 53 spots and every spot has to be filled by somebody who can contribute and it is a business with high dollars at stake and listen before we let you go a very sweet moment also out of training camp there at the bills this week a, a brother making his little sister's dream come true with star quarterback josh allen watch this My sister. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
It's not Taylor Swift, but boy, she really broke down when she saw him. Uh, and this really just shows that these NFL athletes and these teams, what they really mean to people, even young kids, right? But the, the power of sports, too. And uh, one of the local news affiliates followed up on that story in which uh, they asked her, what did it feel like to, to get that hug from Josh Allen? And her response was, I hugged Josh Allen. Uh, she blacked out, I think. <laughs> I got to say, as a dad of two daughters, I love that video. When I saw it today, I said, we got to run it. Tim, thank you. Tim Graham, we appreciate your reporting. You know, NBC covers hundreds of stories each day because you can't possibly read, watch, listen to all of them. So our bureau teams have done it for you and for me. This is what they say is going down in their regions. And you know the segment, it's called The Local. Out of our Northeast Bureau, a scary scene at a New York amusement park. Watch this. Yeah, that's not where it's supposed to go. Park managers blaming an electrical malfunction after the ride sent passengers hurtling in reverse for minutes longer than it should have. The ride is designed to go backwards, but this time the emergency stop button didn't work. And a maintenance team had to be called to cut the power. The park says the ride will stay closed until it figures out a fix. No reports of any injuries. Out of our Midwest Bureau, police in Ohio were responding to a report of a bank robbery when body cam footage caught the suspect in the act. There he is right there. You can see him falling through the ceiling directly into a trash can right in front of the cops. He's been arrested. He's facing a couple of charges. And from our Western Bureau, two very rare and adorable tiger cubs were born at the San Diego Zoo. They're called Sumatra tigers, an endangered species with only about 400 to 600 still on the planet. And the zoo says the cubs' mom is taking very good care of them. And just in time, for World Tiger Day tomorrow. We can all celebrate. Wherever you are, it is the top of the hour, and unfortunately, it's not over yet. Tens of millions of people baking, and yet another dangerously hot day across the country. We've got a reporter in the pool, in the hot Philly sun, with more on why cities are feeling the heat more than the suburbs and the rural areas. Plus, Carly Russell, the woman who faked being kidnapped in Alabama, is now facing charges. Why police want her story to set a precedent, an example for more serious charges when lying to the authorities. Then, breaking in just the last hour, NBC News is learning that President Biden is now acknowledging his seventh grandchild, the young daughter of his son Hunter, after an intense legal battle and criticism from political rivals. What we're learning tonight. Plus, new research on how women in the U.S. are, listen to this, drinking themselves to death? Why? It's in part biological. It's also societal. We've got an expert to join us and break it all down. And a moment that turned into a movement, how transgender men are protesting a beauty pageant in Italy after trans women were told they could not compete. Good day, I'm Tom Costello, in for Hallie on this Friday. And as we come on the air, the Northeast, including D.C., baking under the hottest day of the entire year. Across the country, almost half of us are under heat alerts, temperatures reaching dangerous highs. We can't say this enough, and yes, it's obvious, but the heat is deadly. Listen to this. Maricopa County, Arizona, bringing in refrigerator, refrigerated containers in case they need to store bodies. The medical examiner says they are over capacity already. It's a grim reminder that this is also what happened during COVID, of course. In Minnesota, we're seeing roads buckling in the sweltering temps. That's Minnesota. Where you live plays a big role here. Climate experts say cities feel a lot hotter than the suburbs or rural areas where in the burbs and rural areas, you've got landscape, you've got grass, you've got trees that helps absorb the heat. And it's not just above ground feeling the heat, water temps around the world, the temperatures are off the charts. Take a look at this. The Gulf of Mexico hit a record 86 degrees North Atlantic, almost 80. The Med, the Mediterranean, and the tropical Atlantic, around 83. 
and the worst may be yet to come. We have meteorologist Michelle Grossman standing by, but first let's go to NBC's George Solis. You are still in the water, George. Uh, you're going to be turning out to be a prune with all that water. You are in a city of concrete and asphalt. So talk to us about how important it is for people with this kind of heat, especially the kids, to cool off in these pools. There aren't that many of them, right? That's absolutely right, Tom. There's about 50 pools in the city of Philadelphia. They are fully staffed with lifeguards right now. This has been one of the hot spots, the John B. Kelly pool, where a lot of kids have been spending their day with their families. It's getting to be about that dinner rush, so a lot of families are now taking their leave. But this heat wave continues, so we expect this pool to be packed tomorrow, as it has been over the last several days. I mentioned the lifeguards. The city of Philadelphia doing something fairly unique and offering bonuses to make sure that the lifeguard shortage that we saw nationally was not a factor here. So every lifeguard station here has been full. You can see maybe one or two here in the pool running a little bit of interference for us, just making sure the kids don't splash the camera. That said, though, the city of Philadelphia also has that heat health emergency. So not only are the pools open, Tom, we also have those cooling centers. We have the spray grounds open. We have hotlines that are available for people to call in and make sure that the elderly are being taken care of and right now the messaging from the city of philadelphia is also check on your neighbors check on the kids check on the pets because we know as you touched on earlier here this isn't heat that's uncomfortable it can be deadly even here i am you know nice and cool in the water that sun beating down on me here on my face it's pretty toasty i guarantee you i'll probably get out of this pool with a little bit of a sunburn tom you know and a lot of underprivileged folks don't have ac right and boy do you need it right now especially in an urban environment like philly or new york or, or even here in D.C. That's right, Tom. Some studies have actually shown that neighborhoods without any covering run about 22 degrees hotter. Here in the city of Philadelphia, they're actually looking forward to a federal grant that's going to allow them to plant more trees to provide more coverage because we know climate change is a factor. And so these neighborhoods in big cities are actually running a lot hotter. We spoke with a city official about some of this plan and how these trees are going to help cool, hopefully, the environment. Here's what to say. We know that um, some neighborhoods of the city can be up to 22 degrees hotter than other neighborhoods, and tree canopy has a lot to do with that. Trees are a um, natural air conditioner. They can actually reduce heat, not just because of shade, but by um, releasing it with water vapor. Tom, the city should find out later this year how much of that grant money they will get to find out how many trees they can plant here in the city. In the meantime, George, we're going to keep enjoying you, this pool for a little bit longer. I, I don't blame you. You get the award, by the way, for reporter involvement. George, thank you very much. All right, let's now get to uh, meteorologist Michelle Grossman. And Michelle, you know, George talked about how hot it is there, and I think all of us want to know when is this going to start to give us some relief. I know it is the million dollar question and unfortunately some will not see that relief. Fortunately some will see the relief. So it's all about location but look at these numbers because we're looking at half the U.S. population under some sort of heat alert. Now we mentioned heat is dangerous but in fact, it's the number one cause of weather-related deaths. So this remains a really important story. We're looking at heat alerts from the southwest into the south central states, the plains into the Ohio Valley, and also the northeast. The change will come first to the Midwest, then to the Ohio Valley, Great Lakes, and eventually into the northeast. We have a strong cold front that's moving through that's bringing some storms in portions of the Midwest and also the Great Lakes. It's going to swing through and sweep through uh, the heat, the humidity in the northeast tomorrow. We're going to see some strong gusty thunderstorms, but then we're going to see some relief by Sunday. First, though, on Saturday, we're still looking at 101 as a heat index in New York City. That's what it feels like to your body. 94 in Cincinnati, 97 in St. Louis. This is ahead of the front. Behind the front, we're looking at temperatures much cooler, only 83 degrees in Minneapolis. And we're going to be into the 80s in New York City by Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. Tom? Uh, I think I'm going to Minneapolis. That doesn't look too bad. Listen, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, is this the new normal because of climate change? Are we going to have more of this year after year after year? And we've talked about how hot the oceans are. I know you've got a graphic, but what's the yeah. impact on the fish uh, in the oceans? I know. So the fish, they're going to be, they're delicate and they're going to be impacted. And that's eventually going to impact us. The oceans are a huge source of our economy, transportation. They regulate climate. And we're also looking at where we get food and also pharmaceuticals. So super, super important. Let's take a look at some of these numbers because we are looking at boiling waters in some spots. We're looking at uh, sauna-like conditions on land and then jacuzzi-like conditions in the Gulf. Temperatures into the 80s in the Gulf of Mexico. Remember, it's hurricane season. So we're going to see stronger 
stronger, bigger storms as we go throughout the peak of hurricane season. That's a big concern there. And this is not just in the U.S. We're looking at global uh, records across the globe in terms of the ocean. The Mediterranean Sea, 83 degrees. That's well above normal for this time of year. Tom? All right, Michelle, thank you very sure. much. Mm -hmm. uh, other news, in just the last few hours, police in Alabama charged Carly Russell with lying to authorities and faking her kidnapping. In a hoax that set off a nationwide effort to find her and created a panic about a toddler who might be missing and potentially used as bait, according to police, the police chief says all of that was fake and the charges now are not enough. Take a listen. I know many are shocked and appalled that Miss Russell is only being charged with two misdemeanors. Despite all the panic and disruption her actions caused. Let me assure you, I too share the same frustration, but existing laws only allow the charges that were filed to be filed. New video from our NBC affiliate in Birmingham shows Russell leaving her attorney's office this morning. In a statement, her lawyer responded to the charges saying that we will see where we go from here. You'll remember Russell called police on July 13th claiming she saw a toddler walking alone along the road and then she was gone, allegedly forced into a truck and taken to a house by a man and a woman. That's what she said. But she turned up back at her own house, seemingly unharmed, 49 hours later. NBC's Priscilla Thompson joins me now. Priscilla, walk us through now the charges. And we heard the police chief say he's frustrated that given the panic that this caused, that the charges are, are not more serious. Yeah, Tom, that's exactly right. And the two things that she has been charged with are false reporting to law enforcement authorities and false reporting an incident. Both of those are Class A misdemeanors, each of them carrying up to a year in prison and a $6,000 fine, potentially. And we know that she was arrested and booked earlier today. We saw a photo of her mugshot. She has since bonded out and been released. But what officials are saying is that this is what the law allows for as it is written. And so they have charged her with everything that they can at this point, but their goal is really to send a message that there are consequences to these actions. They really talked about how this has opened up wounds for other families who really have been victims of this type of behavior of kidnapping and also uh, saying that the time and the resources that have been invested in this and effectively a hoax. And so they want to ensure that folks do see that there are consequences for these actions. Tom? Well, you've got to also worry about her own mental state, but this is a story that had people very concerned about a potential kidnapper on the loose. Uh, and from the beginning, you've been on the story and you've talked to her parents, right, about the, the panic that this community was in. Right, and that was very apparent to them. And even in the days after she returned, they were doubling down on the idea that there was still a kidnapper out there. It seemed that they really believed what she was saying. But we know that this week, she, Carly Russell got an attorney, and that attorney released a statement saying that all of it had been a lie. There was no child on the interstate. And the attorney today also saying that, like, she recognizes the severity of these charges and the severity of her actions. And we heard earlier in the statement that she released Carly Russell apologizing to the community and to her family for the harm that she's caused. Tom? Priscilla, you know, you and I have had this conversation, and NBC News has this conversation regularly, uh, underreporting, all of us collectively in the media, underreporting uh, the cases of black women and, and girls when they go missing. And I know that there's some concern that this case, Carly Russell's case, could now work against the issue of trying to get attention to young women and girls, African Americans who go missing. Right. The idea that folks would not be believed because of what Carly Russell has done. And as you point out, we know that there are more than 30,000 black women and girls in America who are missing. And that's not even including the number of indigenous women and Latino women and just women of color overall who are missing, who we know don't get the same level of media attention that some of our white counterparts often do. And so it's one of the reasons why people are saying this case should be an example for how these types of cases should be treated regardless of if it is a, a woman of color or not, but that everyone deserves this type of attention, especially if it can help to bring those missing folks back home to their families. Tom? Absolutely. Priscilla, thank you very much. All right, we have some breaking news just unto us here. President Biden has just acknowledged his seventh grandchild, one that he previously had avoided talking about. 
It's a four-year-old. He, she is the child of President Biden's son, Hunter, uh, that he had the child with a woman he says he had an encounter with while he was battling his cocaine addiction. Remember, back in April, President Biden said he only had six grandchildren, not seven. Take a listen. I have six grandchildren, and I'm crazy about them. And I speak to them every single day. Again, the president now acknowledging his seventh grandchild, first reported by People magazine. Let's go to Peter Alexander at the White House. And Peter, I understand the White House has released a statement. That's right. We just received that statement from the White House, specifically from President Biden himself. And I want to read some of it to you in part. And again, though, to headline the significance here, this is the first time that the president is publicly acknowledging the existence of this seventh grandchild. And it reads in part, our son Hunter and Navy Jones mother, London, are working together to foster a relationship that's in the best interest of their daughter, preserving her privacy as much as possible going forward. London refers to London Roberts, that is the architect and saw a woman who filed a paternity suit against the president's son, Hunter, back in May of 2019. This has become a political issue of sorts, Tom. Republicans have been critical of President Biden for not publicly acknowledging this child, this granddaughter, Hunter's child, out of wedlock. Uh, the president, though, responding to that, says this is not a political issue. It is a family matter. He says, Jill, referring to the first lady, and I only want what is best for all of our grandchildren, including Navy right now. NBC News has also learned that the president going forward will refer to seven grandchildren, not six. In fact, he does just that in a podcast that he taped this week that has not yet been released. And we're getting some more background understanding about how this all came to be, this announcement, this public acknowledgement, a source familiar with the matter, now telling NBC News in their words that you have to remember there were some fairly contentious legal proceedings, they say, between Navy Jones' parents happening until just a few weeks ago. As grandparents, this person tells us the Bidens are following Hunter's lead. They are and have been giving Hunter and London Roberts the space and time they need need to figure this out. Again, the president in some ways trying to inoculate himself against the criticism that he hasn't been acknowledging uh, this seventh grandchild, now doing it publicly. And it really is on brand with the president to acknowledge his entire family, to embrace family, which is one reason why there had been some real questions about this, including from some prominent columnists in the country saying that the president needed to do just that. Tom. All right, Peter, thank you very much. Peter Alexander at the White House. We are learning more about who's who in this new superseding indictment that adds three new charges against former President Trump for his handling of classified documents after leaving the White House. A source familiar with the matter tells NBC News that Mar-a-Lago IT worker Yusil Traderas is employee number four in those documents. The new indictment says Carlos de Oliveira is a maintenance supervisor. Talk to Taveras about how the boss, former President Trump, wanted security footage deleted. Footage that prosecutors say shows Mr. Trump's employees moving boxes of classified documents before the FBI searched Mar-a-Lago. De Oliveira's lawyer did not return NBC's request for comment. Tavares has not been charged. Mr. Trump has pleaded not guilty today. Uh, the former president was hitting back at the charges on a radio show. They're trying to intimidate people so that people go out and make up lies about me because I did nothing wrong. Garrett Haig joins me now with more on this investigation. You know, the details of this mm -hmm. in, in the uh, special counsel's indictment are really meticulous. I'm wondering what the feedback is. Well, it's been interesting. The Trump campaign has responded pretty quickly to this in the way that they often do, describing it as political and really leaning into it as an opportunity to raise money. They've been blasting out fundraising emails. The former president's been posting on social media. They're trying to cast this in the same way they've cast all the investigations into him as a political witch hunt. Now, congressional Republicans got off a little bit, er e uh, a little bit easy here because Congress was out yesterday afternoon. Uh, by the time this indictment was released, most of these folks were at home in their districts. They haven't had the answer difficult questions about it. When they have gotten asked, it's gone something like this. Here's Kevin McCarthy today trying to kind of have it both ways on this indictment. What concerns me is you have a sitting president 
that has a situation like this, but even worse, that had documents, like, but nothing's happened. You've had. And he's, he's a How is it worse? Because he's alleged, they're alleging he's obstructed investigation. He's under investigation. But he's not him. indicted. Why do they keep indicting he might be. Who knows? No, it's forever. It might be. Who knows? That's the point. Who knows? You're a Biden, so it's never going to happen. That's the difference, and that's the frustration. The word seems to have gone out on this, Tom, because that's what we're hearing from a lot of other Republicans, the idea that, hey, look, Joe Biden's been investigated for something similar in terms of investigating his handling of classified documents. Where are the charges on him? I mean, obviously, these are wildly different scenarios, yeah. wildly different cases, but the whataboutism is, the, is sort of the main talking point we're seeing from Republicans right now. So this caught everybody by surprise yesterday, this new superseding indictment, because everybody has been waiting mm -hmm. for a, a possible indictment from the grand jury investigating the, pres the former president's attempt to allegedly overturn the election and specifically related to January 6th. Where do we stand on that potential grand jury indictment that may or may not be coming? Is it or is it not? Well, look, every indication is that it is still coming. It's just a question of when. And we base that mainly off the target letter that Donald Trump received more than a week ago now. Federal prosecutors just don't send that kind of thing unless they are committed to making an indictment. Now, this indictment that came out last night, the superseding indictment, appears to have caught Donald Trump and his attorneys off guard which is fascinating because they were in the office with the special counsel prosecutors just yesterday during the day talking about this election interference case. But I can't get any read on sort of on the record or in any other way that they were given any kind of heads up that this might also be coming. They are very much convinced that Donald Trump will be indicted on something related to the election interference case, but they don't know specifically what and even they don't know specifically when. So they're in this meeting yesterday, and then, oh, hey, by the way, there's another indictment coming, and you didn't know anything about it. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there was any, oh, hey, by the way, which, you know, the prosecutors are under no obligation to tip their hands about things that they're going to do. But, look... The Trump people believe, broadly speaking, that the DOJ is, is not playing this as gentlemanly as they could. Let's put it that way, that this is kind of a bare knuckle legal fight. And the idea that you would have the lawyers for the other side in and not even give them a heads up uh, may be ungentlemanly, but it may also be, you know, the way that the special prosecutor wants to do this by the book. Garrett, thank you. Garrett Haig, always on the story. And in just a few hours, a big moment for Republican presidential candidates. Former President Trump and nearly every other GOP candidate is in Iowa for the same campaign event, the GOP Lincoln Day Dinner. For Mr. Trump, it's a rare appearance at an event that puts him in the lineup with the rest of the crowded field. He's keeping himself busy in the aftermath of the new charges against him that we just talked about, campaigning at two events tonight, then holding a rally in Pennsylvania tomorrow. While for his biggest rival in the field, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, this is a chance to revamp what's become what many think is a stalled campaign, especially now as he's getting backlash from members of his own party over that new education law that we've talked about. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is in Des Moines. The potential Trump indictment looming large over the Lincoln dinner tonight here in Iowa, where 13 presidential hopefuls will take the stage, basically everyone except Chris Christie. And the event will mark the first time that former President Trump and Florida Governor Ron DeSantis will be at the same event here in Iowa, this crucial early voting state. And while President, former President Trump is still enjoying a massive lead here in the polls, Governor DeSantis is trying to reset his campaign and trying to gain some ground. We spoke with some of his supporters at one of his events last night. Take a listen to what they had to say. President I Trump. voted for Trump and I support him 100 percent. But now you think <clears throat> perhaps DeSantis? <clears throat> yeah, just because I don't know that it's Trump's fault that he's got so much baggage, mm -hmm. but because the Democrats just present too much baggage for him. Meanwhile, Governor DeSantis is facing criticism from one of his other GOP rivals, Senator Tim Scott, who is blasting him over those controversial African-American teaching standards that were just adopted by the state of Florida. The governor has said that any criticism of the standards, which includes a portion that talks about potential benefits that uh, slaves got while they were in captivity. The governor said that that was taken out of context, that overall the standards are robust. But last night, Senator Tim Scott said that there is no silver lining to slavery. Joining other Republicans, including Congressman Byron Donalds and Vice President Kamala Harris, in attacking Governor DeSantis. Again, his campaign pushing back on that.
But that issue, plus the issue of the looming Trump indictment, again, looming large here in Iowa, just a few hours before the Lincoln dinner. Back to you. Okay, Gabe, thank you very much. A turmoil in Niger and global condemnation. As the head of Niger's presidential guard has named himself the leader of a transitional government just two days after overthrowing the country's democratically elected president. The general appeared today on state-run television saying the military coup was necessary to avoid what he says is, quote, the gradual and inevitable demise of the country. The political upheaval worrying leaders in the West because Niger is seen as the last reliable partner in the region to combat jihadists linked to al-Qaeda and other extremists. NBC's Courtney Kuby is the only U.S. correspondent on the ground in Niger, and she's joining us now. Nice timing, Courtney. You were there at exactly the right moment. Still a fluid situation, <laughs> right? What's the latest? Yeah, that's right. It's very fluid. So, I mean, you, you mentioned that just today we heard from the head of the presidential guard service he declared himself this is uh this general declared himself as the new president here and what's critical here is after this address to the nation on state-run television, a number of service members, senior service members across the services, Army, National Guard, even the Special Operations Forces, all appeared in a photo with him, seeming to approve this new government. Now, the democratically elected president, President Bazoum, is believed to still be in custody here in Niamey, in the capital being treated well. But at this point, Tom, he has not relinquished power. He has not signed any document saying that he is stepping down. So the U.S. and many other nations around the world continue to recognize him as the democratically elected leader of this country. Now, the big question is, what happens next? And in a simple answer, we just don't know. The U.S. still has not recognized this as a coup situation here because President Bazoum has not resigned. But that's what we're all watching for. Does the U.S., does the world recognize there is an attempted military coup here? And the, again, the democratically elected president may have been ousted, Tom. You know, Niger has been such a critical partner for the U.S., and that's why you were there. You were there to talk about the critical role that the U.S. military is yeah. playing, working with that government and its military to fight uh, extremists. Is there any hint that uh, Russia is in any way behind this coup attempt? So there are a lot of rumors about that. In fact, the head of the, the Wagner group, the mercenary group, Yevgeny Prigozhin, released what appears to be an audio tape from him today saying that they were behind this. We saw protests on the street just yesterday that there were uh, protesters with rave, uh, waving Russian flags, chanting about Russia. But the reality is we've spoken with a number of U.S. officials here. There's no evidence that the Wagner group is here. They have no indication that Russia or Wagner was behind this coup at this point. So, But the Wagner group has a pretty strong presence in this region, specifically in the Central African Republic. And there's a lot of concern that Russia or Wagner may try to use any kind of instability here in this country as a, a chance to gain a, fo a foothold here. It's important to point out there's an, a, a vast resource uranium here that the Wagner Group and many other nations would try to get a hold of for energy resources, for nuclear resources. So that's a real concern. But again, at this point, Tom, there's no indication of that. At this point, it's also important to point out that we've seen some protests in the street, but so far right now, the curfew is holding and the streets are relatively calm, Tom. As always, Courtney Kuby, cutting edge reporting on DOD, Pentagon and Foreign Service type of uh, stories. Courtney, thank you. Stay safe. On Wall Street, stocks today reacted positively to new data that, um, that it suggests rather that inflation is, is finally cooling. The Dow Jones Industrials and the Nasdaq both closed higher. The Dow up half a percent. The Nasdaq up almost two percent today. Both the Dow and the broader S&P have closed out their third straight winning week. And that rally helped along by a key stat that economists use to measure inflation. 
hitting its lowest level in two years. Investors are hoping it means the Fed will pause hiking interest rates, now sitting at their highest levels in more than 22 years. Good news. All right, now here's the bad. Gas prices are going up again. The national average for gas now 3.71 per gallon, up 13 cents from a week ago. Still well lower than where it was at the height of last summer at $5 a gallon. Caleb Silver joins me now. Caleb, let's start with gas prices. How much of this is related to Russia and OPEC cutting back production? And should we expect prices to go even higher? Yeah, we should because this summer we usually get higher gas prices, but Russia and OPEC and OPEC plus curtailing supplies means prices are going to go up. They're trying to keep the supplies down, raise the price, but also this intense heat across the country, that is limiting what refiners are able to refine into gasoline for driving right now. They have to shut down some of the plants, so capacity is low here. You have these two things happening at the same time. We're driving more than ever. That's behind the gas price rise. All right. I was covering the Fed yesterday for NBC uh, Nightly News, and the Fed chair, Jerome Powell, certainly left the door open this week for more rate hikes. But read the tea leaves for us. How likely is it that we'll have another hike in September, or is inflation now starting to improve enough that the Fed can essentially do another pause? Well, you heard the Fed chair say it's all data dependent, data like we saw today about PCE, the Personal Consumption Expenditures Index, the inflation report a few weeks ago, the jobs report, that's all key. The economy is doing pretty well right now. They may, pretty well. They may not have to raise when they meet in 53 days, Tom, and 19 hours. How many seconds do you have that, Caleb? Yeah, that's about 32 <laughs> seconds from now. Okay. Caleb Silver, thank you very much. Coming up from us, some new plans for some old merchandise. What Adidas says it's going to do with all of those leftover Yeezy sneakers after cutting ties with Kanye West. Plus, it kind of sounds like something out of a sci-fi movie, which and how scientists buy, but let me say that again, why and how scientists bought 46,000-year-old worms back to life. That's later in the global. We're back with a flashing headline. Headline: More women in the U.S. are drinking themselves to death, according to new research on CDC data. Overall, drinking still kills more men than women, but the gender gap is narrowing. Data from the last 20 years shows that women's alcohol-related death rate rose by 14.5% compared to 12.5% in men. Researchers say the trend is probably linked, in part, to the normalization of women's alcohol consumption in society. Dr. Kavita Patel is joining us now. We love having her. Uh, and listen, this is important because it's not all societal. It's also true that women metabolize alcohol differently than men? Yeah, three key differences, Tom. One, women have more fat than men do, less water. Fat absorbs the alcohol, water dilutes it, so having more of the fat disproportionately creates a higher level of alcohol. And then we lack as much of the enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase, which breaks down alcohol before it gets to the bloodstream. So that all adds up to a higher toxicity level in women compared to men. And we, anybody who's been to college parties has seen that firsthand, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. But there's there's now this new research also out of Columbia University, and it's talking about there's also it's interesting societally who is impacted women in midlife with the highest socioeconomic status. They seem to be most impacted. Those with the highest incomes, those with the most education and the highest status occupations An increase in marketing may have something to do with this. Yeah, we're seeing an overall trend in what we would call feminization of marketing. So this is marketing geared for drinks and kind of normalizing the behavior around alcohol for women. So everything from actual tailored drinks that are really appeal to women, beers that could appeal to women, and also encouraging happy hours and some of the socialization that often we used to associate with men, but also for women in the career workplace. Wine, yeah, social events, and, and right. getting together and doing pottery mm -hmm. and a glass of wine, right? Right, and, and again, you can do these things in moderation, but what we want to point out is that women's bodies are different, and if we're encouraging these toxic levels of alcohol, that's what's leading to, I think, a higher rate of mortality in women compared to men. Moderation. Yes, that's a key on everything. All right, doctor, thank you very much. Uh, we want to get you over now to the five things our team thinks you should probably know about tonight. Number one, uh, Eagles bass player and singer Randy Meisner has died at the age of 77. He was one of the original members of the Eagles. His voice, 
perhaps most recognized on that song, you know it, Take It to the Limit. In a statement, the Eagles say Meisner had complications from chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Number two, Ford recalling more than 870,000 pickup trucks in the U.S. because the electric parking brakes can suddenly turn on without the driver doing anything. Ford says it's due to a possible wiring problem and that owners can have their trucks inspected at a dealership for free. Number three, Adidas says it's going to put out another batch of Yeezys. It's trying to get rid of its stock after ending its partnership with Ye, formerly known as Kanye West, and it's donating some of the profits to groups fighting anti-Semitism and other types of discrimination that Ye was accused of. Number four, take a look at this Instagram story from Drake today. That's Tupac's gold, ruby, and diamond crown ring right there. And now, Drake is the owner. The ring sold for more than $1 million earlier this week. It's the most valuable hip-hop artifact ever sold at an auction. Number five, the Emmys are going to get pushed back because of the writers and the actor strike. The Emmys were supposed to be in September. Again, pushed back. We don't have a new show date yet. To Italy now, where a whole bunch of transgender men are entering the Miss Italy pageant after a pageant rep said transgender women can't compete. All right, let me lay this out for you here. It's a little complicated. The organizer of the Miss Italy pageant said the pageant only allows people who were assigned a female gender at birth to be in the competition, meaning transgender women, men who became women, would be excluded. One transgender man named Federico saw this and thought, well, hey, I was born female. So he decided to enter the pageant under his birth name, Frederica, even though he identifies as a man now. That moment then turned into a movement. One LGBTQ group shared his entry on Facebook, encouraging other transgender men to apply. And now more than 100 trans men have entered the pageant, with some even being called to the next stage of the competition. Let's bring in Ali Arusi for more on this. Ali, what message does the trans community hope to be sending to pageant officials right now, and how is it being received? Hey, Tom. Well, they're saying that these attitudes are outdated and the people trying to enforce them lack understanding. Federico Barbosa, the trans activist who entered the pageant and started this whole campaign that went viral, says that he thinks beauty pageants try to exclude trans women in part because they simply don't understand them or have a false idea of what it means to be trans. He said excluding trans women from beauty pageants or school sports sends the message that trans women are not women. And, that's, and the result of that is transphobia. Let's take a listen to what Federico had to say. They would never think that a trans person might even like aspire to win a beauty pageant because we're seen as this kind of like three-headed monster and i think a part of it is that so many people have never seen trans women or like trans men or trans people in general but the patron of the miss italy beauty pageant patricia mirigiliani has not only defended the ban on transgender contestants but also appeared to criticize other beauty pageants efforts to welcome trans women um, so it's a it's a bit of a bit of a mess there, but nonetheless it's all it's all getting to a head with all these hundred men entering that competition. So Italy just elected this far right government, and that government has been hostile to gay and trans rights, to gay parents. So how is this protest being received among the broader population in Italy? Well, I mean, look, Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni denounced what she called gender ideology and the LGBT lobby during her campaign. Her government has barred same-sex parents from being listed on children's birth certificates, and, uh, and they aren't if they're not biologically related, and she got elected. So her message resonated with many voters. Clearly, there's a divide in Italy on this issue. And, of course, when government uh, policies don't favor the LGBT community, it's easier for organizations not to make concessions or not to be inclusive. Uh, so it's become a very divisive issue. But, I, I, I th I, uh, but um, as Barbarossa said, hopefully next time this will make them think better. All right, Ali, thank you very much. Ali Rusi is in London. When we come back, scientists right now are on the cusp of a breakthrough that could transform the way we fight climate change. What it has to do with the American chestnut tree, it's coming up in tonight's original. Stay with us.
We're back now, and we want to bring you today's original in-depth reporting on a topic we've been keeping an eye on. As we have been reporting, the record heat waves are having a destructive impact on coral reefs down in Florida. And there's one technology that could help, genetic engineering. Take a look at NBC News' Kerry Sanders' report from last year highlighting this novel technique. The Pentagon gave researchers at the University of Miami a $7.5 million contract to artificially grow coral that's engineered to resist death due to global climate change's warming waters, then transplant that coral to the ocean floor. Pretty cool, right? But coral isn't the only ecosystem that could benefit from this science. As our planet changes, researchers are turning to gene editing to help revive one of America's most iconic trees. And the implications on our food systems are sweeping. Noel Pransky has the story, the rebirth of the American chestnut. 30 feet up in the canopy, scientists nearing a breakthrough that could transform U.S. agriculture. So here you can see like a female. That They're using the latest advances in biotechnology and genetic engineering to bring back the fallen giants of the eastern forests, the American chestnut. Chestnuts roasting on an open fire. A food seared into our heritage and songs, on our ancestors' tables, and often in the tables themselves. American chestnuts were some of the biggest and most prominent hardwood trees in the eastern U.S. Do you have any idea how the girth of an American chestnut at maturity? They could be 18 feet. It's crazy. But around the turn of the century, Westerners accidentally imported the fungus from Asia that caused chestnut blight. And within 50 years, nearly all American chestnuts died, leaving behind only stumps and short-lived tiny trees. Could you imagine what would happen? A blight hits the sugar maple. In 15 years, they're all gone. Look at the culture that disappeared. Every fall going out and tapping the maple trees. That happened to a wide stretch of this country when the chestnut disappeared. Efforts to save the trees began almost immediately. In the 1950s, they took chestnuts and they threw them down into a nuclear reactor in hopes that that would mutate resistance. But breeding resistant trees was only partially successful. So scientists are now turning to gene editing technology to save the species. This is the fascinating part. They use bacteria to transfer a gene found in wheat into a tiny American chestnut embryo. That gene then neutralizes the deadly fungus, so when the embryo grows into a full-size tree, it can survive the blight. This latest genetically modified version is nicknamed Darling 58. At this point, we have several generations of offspring from that initial Darling 58 tree. A team in upstate New York is hand-pollinating wild chestnuts, then letting the trees do the rest of the work for them. In a few months, when those chestnuts drop, some will grow into trees that inherit the resistant gene. And that's what we'll eventually be able to distribute and use for restoration. It'll have some blight resistance and it'll have some diversity. The team will send the genetically modified trees to labs across the U.S. once the process is approved by government agencies. We have really high hopes um, for deploying in the forest. And it couldn't be more urgent. Climate change, diseases and pests threaten countless species that are cornerstones of our agricultural economy and our diets. By 2050, the amount of land that can sustain coffee cultivation will be be reduced by 50 percent. They call it the cancer of the bananas. Imagine a world without coffee, bananas, or chocolate. That's what scientists are trying to prevent. Our forests are seeing these threats on so many different levels right now. Researchers are also looking at this process to try and protect citrus groves in Florida getting attacked by a harmful bacteria. A new gene, in this case from spinach. Scientists and tree lovers banding together to save an American icon and the future of our food and forests. And Noah Pransky joins us now. Uh, Noah, give us a sense of the timing here. When could we see these trees back out in nature? So scientists are confident that it could happen soon because once this is all approved, the Chestnut Foundation then gets them planted in people's backyards ASAP. And these trees grow really fast. So kids born today, 2023, might be able to play in the shade of an American chestnut before they're 18. It's pretty incredible stuff, and of course, these big implications also relate to how other species could survive in our future. 
We need more trees, not fewer trees. Uh, Noah, thank you very much. Good reporting there. Coming up, new details in that Dutch cargo ship fire. What local media say were heard on an emergency call. Plus, Buffalo Bills player DeMar Hamlin back on the field. But our next guest says his future on the team could be in jeopardy. That's after the break. We're back, and now to the Buffalo Bills safety, DeMar Hamlin, who is back on the field at training camp after almost seven months after going into cardiac arrest on the field after taking a direct hit to the chest during the game. Fans cheered him when he returned to the field today, and he's been able to take part in all of the team's workouts. He also sent LeBron James' family his support this week after LeBron's son, Bronny, went into cardiac arrest during a basketball workout. Bronny is now out of the hospital. Tim Graham, senior writer for The Athletic, joins me now from the Bills training camp. Tim, uh, you've been there at training camp. What's it been like for DeMar since starting up on Wednesday? How is he doing? He's doing fine, and really it's too early to say because a lot of the milestones that he needs to hit, both mentally and physically, are yet to happen. Uh, but every day that he is out on the field is pushing forward a pretty inspirational story. Nobody has ever done this before. He's like an astronaut. Uh, we don't really know what's to come. Nobody's ever come back from a sudden cardiac uh, arrest like he has, and uh, it's been inspirational. But you say in your latest athletic piece that he could get cut from the team, that his story could meet the, the cruel business of the NFL. How could this play out? Well, I think it would be unfathomable to a lot of fans uh, or even people who've been paying attention to his story from a mainstream standpoint, because this has broken out of just the sports world. DeMar Hamlin is the sentimental favorite of the, of the sports world and, and people who don't even pay attention much. Uh, but... He is the fourth best safety if everybody's healthy, and that includes him, and if he's mentally prepared to come back from this, he's the fourth best safety uh, playing for a coach who only keeps four safeties. He's going to have to play special teams, uh, and that is the most uh, dangerous of all the aspects of games. You're talking about kickoff coverage, punt coverage, high collision uh, percentage of plays there. Uh, and this has happened before, and it's something that I wrote about for The Athletic. A, a player who was on the stage at the ESPYs giving an emotional speech uh, was cut two months later. Devin Still of the Cincinnati Bengals and his daughter who went through stage four uh, cancer in a very public way, in a very poignant way, and she's okay now. But two months after he was on the stage, uh, after being introduced by LeBron James, to, uh, you know, this was in 2015, uh, just two months later, he was cut. And it is a cruel business. And uh, the Buffalo Bills are a Super Bowl contending yeah. with 53 spots. And every spot has to be filled by somebody who can contribute. And it is a business with high dollars at stake. And listen, before we let you go, a very sweet moment also out of training camp there at the Bills this week. A, a brother making his little sister's dream come true with star quarterback Josh Allen. Watch this. It's not Taylor Swift, but boy, she really broke down when she saw him. Uh, and this really just shows that these NFL athletes and these teams, what they really mean to people, even young kids, right? But the, the power of sports, too. And uh, one of the local news affiliates followed up on that story in which uh, they asked her, what did it feel like to, to get that hug from Josh Allen? And her response was, I hugged Josh Allen. Uh, she blacked out, I think. <laughs> I got to say, as a dad of two daughters, I love that video. When I saw it today, I said, we got to run it. Tim, thank you. Tim Graham, we appreciate your reporting. NBC News covers hundreds of international stories each day. And because you can't possibly read, watch, listen to all of them, our foreign desk has done it for both of us. Uh, here are some of the things they say that they're keeping an eye on. It's a segment we call The Global. From the Netherlands, the Dutch cargo ship that caught fire on Tuesday apparently had many more electric cars on board than initially thought. Uh, the company that chartered, chartered the ship today said that there's almost 500 of those kinds of cars on board, not 25.
Like the Coast Guard first said, it's not clear what started the fire, but Dutch media released a recording of an emergency call where someone has heard saying it started in a battery. One crew member died in this fire, and the fire is still burning. Out of Norway, the country facing a record outbreak of bird flu this year. One city says it's collected more than 10,000 dead birds in the area. And food safety officials put a travel ban in place around three nature reserves. The World Health Organization says the risk to humans is low. And from Germany, they're alive. Scientists reanimated these 46,000-year-old worms that were frozen more than 100 feet deep in Siberian permafrost. Researchers say studying them could help us, help us learn more about conservation methods as the Earth's climate changes and how to freeze yourself or maybe reawakening in a few generations. That's it from us. Top Story starts in three, two, one. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.